uh, report. I found it fascinating. And so I'm looking forward to the uh, presentation. Um, Paulina will speak first, and then Randy. I'm not going to introduce them because you all know who they are. And then we have um, originally Jamie Galbraith is going to be on the panel. He couldn't make it. John Henry is filling in ably. He's going to be talking mostly about FDR and, uh, the, new, and the new deal and, and the jobs program with the new deal. So we'll kind of like give a historical context to some of the present day things that we'll be hearing from Paulina and Randy. So um, with that. My task today is to uh, set up a problem. Um, what I will do is provide some context of the current economic environment and then how this is a really of interpretation of this is for a proposal. Um, Minsky spoke a lot about the failure of the current approach of the method by which we aim to stabilize and stable economy. Um, and whether that method actually delivered what we wanted for employment and better distribution of So he argued that the current approach has this aggregate demand for education that um, is really a pro growth, pro investment model, and it tends to fail on three fronts. Um, he argued that, well, um, we have heterogeneous, uh, inherently heterogeneous markets. The current code simply doesn't produce uh, full employment. Uh, it actually also underwrites underlying processes that create unequitable income distribution and also this problem. So you also talked uh, a lot about how investment, this problem growth for investment approach is financed. And in, in, a, in a case where we have a radical uh, financialization, um, the pro-growth pro investment model relies on a stable financing of capital assets, which induces economic downturns well before we have reached anything close to full employment, and essentially leaves the economy unemployed behind. So we end up with this paradox where we actually have shortages of labor in certain markets. While at the same time, we have millions of people who are still seeking work. Um, and in addition, we, we can add that uh, not only that we leave the chronically unemployed behind, but those vicious processes in those labor market segments generate very large uh, social and economic costs. Okay. So, how can we look at some of these uh, two uh, important problems that we identify? Failure to achieve full employment and the distribution of income. Well, you've probably seen this chart. This is you know, job as a job. Uh, we have become accustomed to something that is highly unusual. We have become accustomed to a situation where a growing economy does not create jobs. Uh, and we have now um, uh, called these jobless recoveries. But you see, the paradigm tends to put jobs last. Right? We're focusing on growth, we're focusing on investment, but um, the jobs in are supposed to be a byproduct of, uh, of that. So what we are proposing is basically a jobs first solution, um, and I'll get to that in a moment, but basically the chart shows you how long it takes to recover the lost payrolls. And since the 80s, with every expansion, it's taken slower and slower, longer and longer to recover lost payrolls. Um, so that's one way to tell the story. There are many other ways. This is one visual that I really like uh, that illustrates the unemployment problem as it exists even in robust expansions. So this is a map of unemployment that shows you um, essentially three recessions, the early 1990s recession. Okay. 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 So what this, what this um, map will show you is the unemployment rate across the United States as it evolves from the early 1990s to the 2016. And it goes over um, three recessions, the early 1990s recession, the Goldilocks economy, the boom of the Clinton economy, then it will go into the uh, Bush uh, recession in the early 2000s, and then the Great Recession, and how the economy has recovered after the Great Recession. So watch at the evolution 
of unemployment where dark areas represent unemployment above 10%. <coughs> so we entered the early recession in the 1990s. You see how the map is populated with pockets and pockets of mass unemployment. The economy begins to recover from that recession and enters the Goldilocks economy. The map clears, but you can still identify areas that suffer from persistent unemployment. We now uh, finish with the Goldilocks economy. We enter the uh, early 2000s recession. We recover out of it and enter the housing boom growth period. Uh, which of course culminates in the Great Recession. In 2007, the map starts to become very, very dark. We are now officially in recovery. 2008 is officially in recovery, uh, and yet it takes longer and longer and longer to clear this map. The official unemployment rate never reached above 10%. I believe it in November 2009, it reached 10%. But um, on average, we would go 10%. And yet, if you actually look at the geographical pattern of unemployment, you would notice not only did communities suffer from very deep and persistent unemployment throughout the two decades, but also it seems that like there is a bit of a contagion effect uh, in, in the evolution of unemployment. If there is an onset of unemployment in one distressed area, it seems to precipitate and like an avalanche effect, affect the neighboring areas. And so this understanding, the spatial understanding of unemployment, also informs our proposal, uh, which is very targeted. Um, income distribution. This we argue that uh, the growth process underlines or underscores processes that generate income inequality. And the way I like to look at it is I'd like to ask the question, when income grows, who gains? So this chart shows you how income is distributed during expansions between the top 10% and the bottom 90% of families. And what we notice is this gradual erosion of the share of income in the households at the bottom 90%, which sees a fundamental <coughs> shift in the 80s, and then growth seems to deliver income growth for select few. After the 80s, every expansion uh, has delivered the large um, uh, majority of income gains to uh, the top 10% of households, which of course are very heterogeneous um, components anyway. That's a very heterogeneous group. Uh, the top 0.01% of families earn 100 times the average real income of the top 1% of families. So I've looked at this data multiple ways, and I've looked at it from 2013 onwards to the present day, and what you would notice is that in this latest expansion, income improved first for the top 0.1%, then for the top 1%, then for the next 5 to 9%, then for you know, the average 10%, and incomes for the bottom 90% of families today Real average incomes are lower than they were in 1997. All right. So, what was Misty's approach to employment? The alternative was simply a direct uh, program, the unemployed last resort, he called it. Um, and he said the task here is to figure out a system, a way to provide an infinitely elastic demand for labor at a base wage. In other words, that we divorce the offer of employment from the profitability of employment, by which he meant that you can't rely solely on the private sector mechanism, employment growth engine, to create an employment. You need to have something else, a supplemental program that will provide employment on demand to those who have been left behind by private sector <coughs> dynamics. And so this is our interpretation. Um, we've taken for many years on the draft of the proposal. We are now um, proposing a public service employment in the spirit of earlier writings as the path to full employment. So, the key ingredients of our proposal, as I said, this is jobs first solution. We think of it as a public option for jobs that offers the same work and work. Somebody's seeking work, you've got any options or not at all, but you can have a private. Conventional public work, but if for some reason you are not able 
to obtain any of those, there will be another public option to jobs that will be guaranteed at, um, a, uh, at a base uh, in the So it's a permanent program. This is not a program that we uh, put in place in desperate times. It's an ongoing program. As we noticed, the last 20 decades, we can see many communities that can benefit from a targeted direct employment program to reduce those very elevated levels of unemployment. So we see it as a policy that is part of a bold structural reform agenda um, that deals with this one specific problem, the inadequacy of number of jobs. And Ryan Ray is going to show us um, uh, the estimates for uh, you know, how many jobs we have. We envision it as a federally funded program uh, that is locally administered, that has universal access. In other words, it's a voluntary program. Um, that provides opportunities on demand and it's open to everyone. Um, irrespective of um, their race, sex, color, creed, or labor market status. In other words, do not say that, oh gee, you have a job at your restaurant, a local restaurant, you're not qualified for this program. If, for example, your job is not able to move out of poverty, by all means, you're welcome into this program because that is one of our objectives. To establish an above poverty and living wage law. We envision it as a program that provides good jobs. This is not good work. We encourage plenty um, of uh, public sector work to be done. And we propose a living wage of $15 an hour plus basic benefits uh, to team up with some other progressive um, objectives, such as the fight for 15 and securing some other fundamental economic rights. Um, <coughs> This is not just an employment program and uh, an employer last resort. We think of it as a both as a safety net, meaning that uh, it captures everyone who wishes to work, but it is also a transitional program. It is a stepping stone to other employment opportunities, better than employment. Whether those are in the private sector, whether those are in uh, the conventional public sector um, areas, um, uh, we, you know, part of the design is to help people transition. Now, what the program is not, um, it's not compulsory work that we do not believe we're going to be taking away from the Medicare or we will provide it only on the condition of work, right? We won't be taking it on the benefits unless people are working. And what we find in our estimates is that actually the career functions is such a way to reduce other social expenditures. Um, it's not a handout or make, make work. You know, it's necessary to emphasize this. We, we do want to do some good in the community. It's not temporary. Um, and it's not 100% employment. We don't believe everybody should be working. Uh, there are good reasons why some uh, people cannot, should not, uh, but we will be providing uh, flexible options, full-time and part-time options, uh, for those that have other needs and demands on their time. And it's not based on the NIRU. We do not envision some sort of natural rate of unemployment that exists out there. We believe that we don't actually uh, know what that is. Again, the estimates will tell you how many people we believe are in need of work. Um, we believe it should be open to all. Okay. And it's not just another infrastructure project. And a lot of people, when they think about this program, you know, they imagine you know, large bridge, bridge building and huge uh, public works. Uh, we are really talking about a program that fits the job to the worker, to their skill level, to uh, their abilities. Uh, and that might actually require a lot of smaller projects um, that, um, provide those jobs. Okay, what are the benefits of the direct approach? Well, full employment, but really true full employment, meaning everyone who wants a job at above poverty pay has one. The counter cyclical mechanism is an important feature of this program. Um, we basically, from a policy point of view, have two options. We either have an unemployed buffer stock or employed buffer stock. The unemployed buffer stock is essentially what we have today. When we look at the evolution of unemployment, we see that it expands with recessions and shrinks and expansions. 
That is the buffer that stabilizes economic growth. We provide various income supports, the automatic stabilizers <coughs> kick in, they're not terribly robust, but it is the unemployed that essentially are the bulwark against uh, you know, growth or inflation um, uh, uh, problems. So you know, the Naira is used as a, policy, um, as a policy benchmark as well. So we say you know, there's just a better, a better approach. Instead of using the unemployed to expand and shrink, the pool of unemployed to expand and shrink, we can put in place an employment program that will provide the same function to the economy, but will in fact generate a much more stable business cycle because it does not permit the evolution of mass unemployment. It stops it in its tracks, in a sense, and uh, it, does, it prevents the evolution of some of the other costs of unemployment. So these are the two policy options. We either choose uh, unemployment to expand and shrink, or we just devise a program that expands and shrinks. Um, by virtue of it being a full employment program, it stabilizes the wage floor and um, establishes a labor standard. In other words, if uh, this is the public option and the private sector uh, is not providing the wage or the benefits that we would be providing here, they will have to match those to be able to uh, retain employees. Uh, it's a targeted approach, so it, uh, it will benefit most distressed areas. Um, and it's also a pre-distribution pre policy. Uh, we are putting a pro-employment growth model. We don't wait for growth to recover to generate the requisite number of jobs. We create them directly, and growth is a result of those stabilization uh, efforts. Therefore, thereby, we strengthen the labor um, share of income. So in, in a sense, as Minsky called it, this is a bubble up uh, policy because we stabilize incomes at the bottom. For those who have the most unstable income, the most precarious labor market experience, and uh, we secure a, uh, a, a true minimum wage for the economy as a whole. I, I really want to stress this point again. This is a prevention, a policy of prevention. It's not just a cure. <coughs> it's not a policy that comes too little, too late after the, we're in the midst of a crisis, but it is a standby employment offer that allows people who lose their employment, rain or shine, to enter into the program stabilize their income, stabilize their spending patterns, and transition out of the program as the, they find other uh, opportunities. Okay. And as a, you know, this is not a panacea, let's not oversell it, but it does have some very important macroeconomic effects. What it would, uh, how are, I think this, yeah, this is important to stress of how our proposal differs from others. You have probably noticed that uh, uh, a lot of people have discovered the job guarantee in the last year. There are a number of proposals that are floating out there. Um, well, our proposal is simple. Uh, we provide jobs for all. We do not target some level of Nairo. Uh, well, the Center for American Progress, for example, has a proposal that, that targets a specific, a specific labor force participation rate. We believe that you don't really know what is the adequate or appropriate level of labor force participation rate, and that results in a very small job creation target <coughs> as compared to others. Uh, ours is a direct and targeted employment approach, not subsidies uh, or incentives to private firms to employ the unemployed. Uh, because our focus is really on the chronically unemployed. We believe this is where the economic programs of problems are mostly concentrated. Uh, this is our target group. We um, have, are looking at labor market dynamics of other uh, workers of higher skill and higher education. They don't experience the same unemployment spells. They don't experience the same precarious labor market condition. They don't experience the shuffling of in and out of jobs, precarious work. So we are really targeting um, uh, the, the, the bottom of the income distribution. We offer a uniform base wage. Um, there are some proposals that are offering tiered, um, tiered uh, uh, wage structure. So we basically um, don't particularly like this approach for several reasons. Uh, first, the New Deal experience showed that this is politically very difficult to try to fit high skill, middle uh, skilled people to various jobs, um, but also, 
Uh, we think that, again, we're targeting the chronically unemployed, and what we would like to do is just establish a stable minimum wage floor. So that the wage in this program, a uniform at 15 plus basic benefits, becomes what Minsky called a high quality anchor for wages. Um, there are various other problems with, uh, with fitting you know, different skill level people to different uh, jobs. There are some substitution effects. Um, but as I mentioned, during growth periods, it's the high wage, high skilled people that tend to see their employment opportunities improve first and their incomes grow first. So what we're really looking at is a true bottom-up policy that um, will um, uh, increase incomes at the bottom faster um, than at the top. Okay. Another way in which our program is different. Uh, greater economic stability. Uh, you know, if you have multiple groups that are being um, placed into public sector jobs, uh, then we don't exactly have a very robust counter-cyclical employment mechanism that keeps uh, inflationary pressures at bay. Um, and I, you know, here we can talk a little bit more about you know, our inflationary impact, but uh, as I said, if incomes at the top for the high skill, high wage people are improving faster in a, a booming cycle, improving those employment, targeting those employment opportunities kind of feeds that process, right? And so what we are trying to do is really uh, improve the income distribution by uh, stabilizing incomes at the bottom. Um, okay, so it's locally run. There are proposals that envision that this is um, not just federally funded, but also the, the workers are federal employees. Um, we believe that there should be some participation on the state, local level, and the nonprofit uh, sector. Um, the size of our program is about 10%, can, can be up to 10% of the labor force, and the federal employment, um, uh, federal employment today is about 2% of the labor force. So, you know, if we were to do this strictly through federal employees, we will have to increase the size of the labor force five times, where the state and local and nonprofit uh, sectors are larger in size and therefore much more capable of absorbing the extra uh, workers into their payrolls. And again, it's not just another infrastructure project. Small and uh, first, yeah, small projects will be important. So what it would look like in the United States, uh, we just propose to convert the unemployment offices into employment offices. When you go to the unemployment office, you can find a job. Um, that those will be kind of repositories of employment opportunities that will be solicited from nonprofits, from local um, job providers, and they will be job lists, essentially, that we will attempt to match then the unemployed with appropriate uh, employment opportunities given their skill level. So um, it is essentially a preparedness response because we have uh, this particular design, and you know I envision really a, a sort of a parallel to the CDC strategic national stockpile um, program that we have out there that essentially has countless of warehouses across the country um, holding vital medicine for in case of emergency. So, you know, we were thinking of using the job centers, the unemployment offices, to be these warehouses of employment opportunities that will be provided on demand. And if there is a financial crisis, and if there is a sudden onset of mass unemployment, then people can, uh, can go in that emergency and find their adequate, you know, uh, adequate number of employment opportunities. So these are the community jobs banks, uh, the proverbial on the shelf jobs. Um, I'm not gonna get into the funding mechanism, but the key things I want to, I want to point out, and it's important that the funding mechanism allows or can accommodate cyclical fluctuations. Um, so that would be probably the most important thing about how this program is funded. Who will, be, who will run it? The Department of Labor, um, uh, and uh, will, um, it, the program will be part of the Department of uh, Labor's mission, but it will be in conjunction with the states and municipalities and these unemployment offices, as well as 
public institutions and community groups will participate in the proposal of projects um, that they can send either directly to the Department of Labor or through their um, uh, localities, uh, as well as NGOs and social enterprises uh, will be allowed to propose jobs projects. Uh, what would it look like? We, we're thinking of a care program, a program that essentially uh, addresses uh, the needs, the care needs, environmental needs in the community, the environment or care for the people, um, and that can include monitoring programs, rehabilitation, public investment. I'll give you just a couple of examples before I conclude. Um, care for the environment, you know, a 21st century tree army. Um, looking at soil erosion, food con flood control initiatives trying to address the food desert problem in the United States, which is basically the problem of having many communities without access to decent and healthy food. So whether it's community gardens, whether it's rooftop gardens, whatever those are, um, they can be part of that initiative of addressing the food desert problem, uh, land terracing, terracing, weatherization. Care for the community, again, um, co-working spaces, tool libraries, theaters, oral history projects. Um, bike lanes, recycling initiatives. Care for the people, um, looking at uh, outreach programs for veterans at risk, uh, former inmates, shadowing teachers, shadowing nurses as a form of on-the-job training, um, <coughs> urban campuses, and so on and so forth. And so uh, I'm just gonna conclude uh, that I think the time for job creativity has come. Uh, there has been a recent uh, poll that surprised me even, uh, and I've worked on this for 20 years, but the poll um, conducted by Data for Progress a couple months ago showed the majority of Americans support the job guarantee program. And, and interestingly, even in deep red states, the support is upwards of 70%. jobless recovery, all recoveries are jobless now, okay? And this uh, just shows that uh, even at the business cycle peaks, each subsequent peak, we have a higher level of unemployment. Uh, using a broader measure of unemployment, we've still got about 10% of the labor force unemployed even at the peak of the business cycle. Um, and the Fed, as was mentioned in the earlier panel today, has already started to fight against this, which it always does. It always fights as we go into the next recession. And it's a pretty good predictor when the Fed starts fighting inflation, you can be pretty sure we've already headed into the recession. Um, we also have these very disturbing trends, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with now, especially for uh, the uh, prime age men in the labor force. Uh, this is often dismissed, uh, the, the declining labor force participation rate, especially of men, is often dismissed as, well, it's just the normal aging of the population. But if you're looking at the prime age, of course, that doesn't apply. These are people in the prime of life, and we see the labor force participation rates 
of men declining on trend. We saw uh, labor force participation rate of women was rising, which drove the overall labor force participation rate. But that trend is over too, and you can see that uh, with the global financial crisis, everything uh, deteriorated even further, and we have not recovered, even though we are at the peak and we're getting ready to start trying to increase the unemployment rate. Another piece of evidence which I presented last year, so some people have seen this, uh, is that the U.S. is very unusual because you look at the rest of the OECD, they're aging too, they're aging faster than we are, and they also have a, a much higher labor force participation rate than we do, and their labor force participation rate is still going up. Okay, so we are unusual. We have a major problem in the United States. So as uh, Pauline was talking about, we need a public option. Uh, we're going back to the old term that we used to use, public service employment. In part, this is to distinguish ourselves because as Paulina mentioned, there are many, many proposals coming out right now and there are endorsements by major uh, uh, public, publicly elected uh, people on the Democratic side. Uh, so to distinguish uh, our proposal, we went back to our earlier term, uh, public service employment. It also emphasizes the kinds of jobs that most of these jobs are going to be. It has to be permanent. We need this even at the business cycle peak. Uh, it has to be universal. We need jobs in every community. Um, they need to be good jobs and at good wages. Um, so I'm going to uh, go through the uh, results of our uh, simulations uh, for the impacts on the economy, um, total employment and private employment, uh, national output, poverty rates, state and local government budgets, all improve. Um, there are manageable effects, and I will give you the data, on the federal budget and on inflation resulting from this program. Now keep in mind, as Paulina said, we're paying $15 an hour. That is a very large increase in wages all over the United States. We picked the number because that is a, a current progressive proposal. We, we uh, believe that that is the right thing to do. And, uh, and so your first reaction will be, hold it. We're going to create lots of jobs. And everybody in the US at the bottom is getting a pay increase, a massive pay increase to $15 an hour. Boy, that's not inflationary. Well, let's see. Um, assumptions. Uh, Scott uses the FAIR model. He's been using it a long time, so he's very familiar with the inner workings. I am not. Um, it has proven to provide a robust fit to the real world data since 1970, early 1970s. It even did well in the global financial crisis. Okay, that is pretty amazing. The program pays $15 an hour, $31,000 annually. For full-time work, the average work week in the model is 32 hours. That accounts for uh, some part-time workers and full-time. Workers can choose which they want to do, okay? So they can work part-time or full-time. Non-wage benefits are set at 20% of wages. Those are uh, health care and child care for the most part. Materials and other costs are 25% of wages. When you look around the world, at uh, programs that are something like a job guarantee, that is very typical. About 25% of wage costs are required for the materials. Um, we realize that in the real world, you would gradually phase the program in. You can't go full scale na nationwide in uh, one quarter. And we realize that going to $15 an hour immediately will have a huge impact on private employers and so on. And so we know that in the real world it's going to be phased in and the wages will gradually increase just as the uh, current $15 an hour wage proposals phase it in through 2022. However, for the purposes of the simulation, uh, we actually already began implementing it this quarter and it will be fully phased in in one year. So by the end of uh, 2018, it would have been fully phased in just for the purposes of the uh, modeling. We ran four simulations. We used two settings each for two alternative scenarios. The first is higher and lower bound versions of the program. 
And uh, the second uh, set of scenarios, we simulate it with and without the Federal Reserve's interest rate reaction function. So the higher bound version adopts assumptions that lead to greater employment in the program, which means it, it will cost more and the inflationary impacts will be larger. Um, with the Fed's reaction function turned on, the Fed is presumed to raise rates to lean against the wind. So as the Fed sees the extra employment boosting GDP and possibly inflation, the Fed will start raising interest rates. Now, we've always argued that once you have a job guarantee in place, when the Fed starts tightening, all it does is move workers out of the private sector into the job guarantee program. The Fed can no longer cause unemployment, okay? So when the Fed is raising rates, it's actually fighting against the private sector. That might change the dynamics of policy making when they realize that is what they're doing. In any case, um, the, the, uh, with the Fed turned on, you are going to um, have a bigger program, but lower inflation, okay? I'll highlight the higher bound with the Fed turned off. That's what we do in the report, although we report everything, but we emphasize this one, and the reason is because we want to give a chance to the inflation naysayers, okay? So I'm going to give you the most inflationary uh, and almost the most costly. It actually isn't quite as costly as having the Fed turned on because by raising rates, the Fed will increase interest service. Main findings, I'll summarize, then show you the graphs. Uh, employment in the program, so these are for the upper bound. Uh, employment in the program peaks in 2022 at just over 15 million workers. The stimulus provided by employing these workers creates an additional 4 million permanent private sector jobs. So we're increasing employment by about 19 million workers. Approximately 5 million workers come into the PSE jobs from each of the three main labor force categories. So we have people moving from unemployment into jobs, from employment and other kinds of jobs into these jobs, and from out of the labor force. It's just about equally distributed among those three categories. Employers of the rest of the part-time and lowly paid workers have to compete with the job guarantee program. So we assume that all the rest of the employers, okay, other than the five million who lose their workers, are able to compete. And they do raise their wages, which is what you find when the minimum wage goes up, in spite of what everyone says about minimum wages causing unemployment. Most private sector employers raise their wages to the minimum wage. They don't benefit. The uh, peak to real GDP uh, averages almost 600 billion per year. The increase of inflation over the baseline peaks at 0.74 percentage points. Huge program, $15 an hour. It doesn't even increase inflation by one percentage points. That uh, fall starts falling after 2020. <coughs> to 0.09 percent <coughs> at the end of the period. So the long-term impact on inflation is absolutely negligible. While federal spending rises, federal <coughs> tax revenue also rises, so that the net increase to the budget deficit is about 400 billion per year, which is about one and a half percent of GDP. That's the maximum, this is the biggest uh, uh, program. State budgets improve by about 53 billion a year. Now we have uh, perfect, in part on purpose, in part because of the difficulty of doing it, we have um, been very conservative in estimating cost savings to programs that already are targeted to spending on low-income people. Okay, so the actual cost savings are probably very much bigger than what we have included in the model, so the net impact on the budget deficit will be much smaller than this number. Okay, so very quickly, uh, here are the upper and lower bounds of uh, employees. You can see it's somewhere between 11 and 15 uh, million employees. Additional GDP is between 400 and almost 600 billion dollars. Uh, private jobs created is between three and four million, upper and lower bounds. The increase of inflation, you can see uh, it peaks 
0.69, a bit less in the lower bound simulation, and it declines steadily over the period. The net impact on the federal budget, the, uh, I've shown here the net budget impact less interest and net budget impact with interest. Because the deficit is bigger, there will be more bonds issued so that interest payments will be higher. In any case, you can see the maximum is about 1.5% of GDP. Positive impact on state budgets. Obviously, a bigger program has a more positive impact on the state budgets. Um, I won't go through the table. There's a lot of data here. But it's not surprising that the program disproportionately uh, positively impacts minorities and uh, female minorities. Whites uh, have a smaller proportion in the labor, in this uh, job program than they do in the labor force, which you would expect. Jobs and poverty alleviation. Employment reduces the likelihood an individual will fall below the poverty line, so we do some calculations in the report to try to see uh, how, potentially, how much poverty do we eliminate with this program. The poverty rates for individuals between 18 and 64. Among those who do not work, the poverty rate is over 30%. If they uh, work less than full-time, it's about 15%. If they work full-time, it's about 2%. Minsky did exactly the same thing in 1974 and shows Wow, isn't it surprising? A job, a full-time job, eliminates poverty. Okay. <laughs> poverty rates for families with children under six. A family with no workers has a 90% probability of being poor. Uh, families with only one part-time worker, 56. Families with one full-time worker, 10%. Okay, now, put in place the program. Uh, setting an effective minimum wage of 31000 a year. The job guarantee would lift nine and a half million children out of poverty if one member works full time year round. If two members work full year, uh, sorry, one full time, one part time, you raise 12 million. If um, two members of the household are employed full time, you lift all children out of poverty. Okay, that's it. Take question. I'm against an ELR program or a WPA. I want to see Roosevelt impeached. Uh, I support these programs, okay? but there's a fundamental issue that I want to deal with and that anybody promoting an ELR program or a JG job guarantee program has to deal with. Uh, uh, I want to uh, talk about two New Deal programs the Civil Works Administration of 1933 through March 34, and then the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, which was organized in 35 and renamed to the Work Project Administration, get rid of that word progress, uh, in 1939. And just focus on a particular issue, problem, concern that has to be addressed that Jan Kregel in his introductory remarks uh, this morning snuck up on but didn't elaborate. And I'm not going to elaborate it either, but I'm going to be a little more overt than Jan because uh, I can't be fired. <laughs> uh, now, start with the Civil Works Administration without going into details. Organized in November 1933, extremely successful, though short-lived. In its first two months of operation, it employed uh, four million workers. Roads were constructed, sewer lines laid, uh, hospitals built, uh, school houses built, and 50,000 teachers were hired to keep schools open and also to develop adult literacy classes. Extremely successful. Given its success, why was the CWA disbanded after only five months of operation? 
The CWA, the Civil Works Administration, ran afoul of conventional political ideology and the economic organization of a liberal that is capitalist uh, democracy. <coughs> the main concern, and I've got quotes, the main concern was that workers would come to expect government to provide them with employment necessary to purchase their <coughs> subsistence. In other words, guaranteed subsistence. And guaranteed subsistence has been a real problem in liberal democracies, uh, starting at least with the French Revolution. And if I had five days, I could develop that uh, argument. So we'll skip it. Uh, President Roosevelt instructed Harry Hopkins, who was the chief administrator of both the CWA and the WPA, along the following lines. This is Roosevelt. We must be careful it does not become a habit with the country, that is government employment. We must not take the position that we are going to have permanent depression in this country, and it is very important that we have somebody to say that quite forcefully to these people. The CWA and the WPA, along with other New Deal programs, were emergency programs. The idea was to get the economy moving again and then get the heck out of the way because government intrusion in the economy was a violation of standard liberal, and by liberal I mean the old-fashioned liberal, classical liberal, right, individualist uh, ideology or political arrangements. Now this concern carried over into the WPA and was largely responsible, actually, for significant shortcomings in the program. And the major shortcoming in the program was that it only employed one-third of the unemployed, right? Uh, even though, of course, it was very successful in what it did accomplish, although you might quarrel with the building of so many post offices. <laughs> in any case, the major shortcoming was its limited scope that was determined by the constraints imposed by the liberal capitalist order itself. Harry Hopkins puts the matter succinctly. Policy from the first was not to compete with, the private, with private business. Hence, we could neither work on private property, set up rival merchandising systems, nor form a work outlet through manufacturing even though manufacturing had contributed to relief roles, hundreds of thousands of workers accustomed to operating machines and to doing nothing else for a living. And Poblina spoke to the issue of matching uh, skills and uh, work effort, right? Roosevelt, in his 1935 January message to Congress, states, stated, all work undertaken should be useful. Pay attention to that word in the sense that it affords permanent improvements in living conditions or that it creates future new wealth for the nation. Compensation on emergency public projects should be not so large as to encourage the rejection of opportunities for private employment or the leaving of private employment <coughs> to engage in government work. The projects undertaken should be selected and planned so as to compete as little as possible with private enterprise, okay? Now, the, the essence of the, the problem was this. The rabble <coughs> had been aroused, and if you remember Jan's remarks in earlier today, the rabble is very important, how to control or contain the rabble, right? Uh, these emergency programs, and, and in the 1930s, the rabble had certainly been aroused, right? There was a lot of opposition the economic order and the political organization. Now, go back to that word useful, right? This takes us back to Adam Smith's distinction between use and exchange value that superficially doesn't appear to be all that significant, but in fact, it is. Quoting Harry Hopkins again, uh, WPA projects were those, quote, that are socially useful, which are important to the nation, which are outside the ordinary scope of our economic system. I would not have us competing by public works with private industry. 
So any excluded from WPA projects were any activities that involved the exchange of the final output. They were to be of use value only. Exchange was reserved for the private sector, the capitalist uh, sector specifically. And if you know your economics, which all of you do, of course, exchange is absolutely necessary to the realization of monetary profit. And monetary profit is what it's all about. Keynes, Minsky, name your poison. Who? <laughs> Oh, Marx. Yeah, there is Marx, too. <laughs> uh, okay, so excluded from WPA projects were manufacturing, commercial activities, merchandising, marketing, whatever the case may be, uh, because that is, all those involved uh, exchange. Now, this raises a very interesting point. The CWA and the WPA demonstrated that government, should it choose to do so, could organize the production of use values independent of exchange, because that's what the WPA did, right? So you could expand that, right? The fear was that such a course would expand to the point where capitalist commodity production, use value for exchange, would be seen as unnecessary. And there were economists at the period who were proposing exactly that. Hence the charge stemming from both the left and the right that Roosevelt was really a socialist, right? Well, and the other charge was that he was a fa fascist. And the, <laughs> and the New Deal programs were socialist in their effect. For the liberals of the day, those equating liberalism and capitalism, the New Deal was anathema, right? And in chronicling the early neoliberal movement, the New Deal represents the slippery slope leading to totalitarianism, high act the road to surface. Uh, surf. Thus, in conclusion, while it is possible to construct a rational jobs guarantee program, and I think that these people have, right? and you can defend that program theoretically, and these people have, the question is, is it actually feasible to introduce in the form that is proposed within the constraints of a capitalist economy? Now, this goes beyond the standard issue of the necessity for a reserve army to be employed and keeping the working class in check and matters of that sort. It actually strikes at the economic heart of a capitalist social organization. Basic, how to control the rabble, which in this ca case, the unemployed, within the constraints of liberal property order dedicated to the pursuit of monetary profit, rather than the production of subsistence for the population. All right, that's it. Yeah. And I, I think, I, I noticed that in this uh, report, they cite a paper that it has much more information than my 10 minutes of fame. And I'm not Jimmy Galbraith. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, then. Uh, three great presentations. We originally were scheduled to run until noon, but because we started a little late, we can run a little late, and we'll just go by how much interest there is, how many questions there are, because we want this to be very interactive, and we want a lot of people to weigh in. Hold you, I'm going to ask a couple things first, just to get things started, but then I'm going to try to get everybody involved. Um, I think there's something very elegant about the basic idea of this, which is that the buffer becomes the employed rather than the unemployed, and it's it's just a uh, conceptually kind of brilliant switch. Um, but when you start implementing it, you, you, sub, you see some of the problems that uh, John mentioned. And one thing I did is I, uh, in preparation for the session, I went to look at the 
May 2017 edition of the National Occupational Employment and Wage Estimates. The median wage in the U.S. as of May 2017 was 18, 12 an hour. So 15 is getting kind of close to that, and there are many, many occupations where the median is actually <clears throat> below 15 an hour. Uh, fast food cooks, 10, 10, 12. Security guards, 12, 96. Butchers, 14.85. Bakers, 12.35. I could not find candlestick makers. <laughs> um, uh, but so, so you're in a situation, going back to what he said about FDR, where you are, is a giant sucking sound of all these people who are making less than $15 an hour in kind of unpleasant jobs who are thinking, yeah, I'll take one of those government jobs with good benefits, too, um, and probably less work. Um, than I'm doing now. So, you get a, what I would imagine happening is implementer over four quarters or eight quarters or however many quarters, huge number of people quitting the jobs and signing up for a government job. Naturally, the reaction is then the private sector raises its wages to pull people back. And then you get into a question I don't want to get too deep into, but it, because it's all about, well, how high should the minimum wage be? Um, in some sectors, um, you can raise it. In others, uh, say, say those that are more the tradable sector, where you're competing more with imports uh, and foreign workers, it's going to be very hard for employers to raise pay that much uh, without going out of business. You might see uh, companies turning towards more automation. So, th again, this is a well-worked territory, but I just want to note that a big element of your of your program here is, is that it's raising the wage floor versus the cyclical aspect, which is the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, if somebody's making $50 an hour and becomes unemployed, that person is probably not going to take a $15 an hour job. They'll just sit and wait until they can get a $50 or a $40 an hour job. Meanwhile, so that's in, in periods of high unemployment, weak economy, your job guarantee, your public service employment, actually does not alleviate unemployment for people in the upper tiers of the economy, which is a lot of people. Meanwhile, uh, it, it does help the people in the bottom tier, for sure. But then you have the, sort of the opposite problem at the bottom tier, which is uh, the whole concept of the buffer is that when the economy is really strong, the government dials back its program, right? Because those people are theoretically more able to get jobs in the private sector. But what you could find happening is economy overheating, relations rising, people are worried that this job program has is, is gotten too big and they want to dial it back. If, it's, if it is a need a buffer, then that's what should happen. I mean, that's the whole notion of a buffer. I really have trouble imagining politically that the government's going to start laying millions of people off of the government roles just because the economy's strong. Um, we see what happens when the Fed raises interest rates when the economy is hot. Is it really realistic that the government, which is less insulated would, would so directly um, use its buffer power to reduce employment. Um, I have some other things, but you have a lot to talk about with what John said and what the two of us said, and you probably want to talk to each other, so let's go with that. And All right, so um, first, the program wipes out mass unemployment situations. It's, it's a structural reform. So that there, are, there are several things about it. So the, the wages one and the buffer stock is the second question. The wage, we agree. It can be quite disruptive on the, you know, on the short run. We believe as a structural reform, it is the only way that we can establish an effective minimum wage and an above poverty minimum wage. Because, you know, essentially, if somebody needs work today, it's no good that the state has a 15 an hour law. Like, you know, you know maybe, maybe they have living wage ordinances, but if they can't find work, then that doesn't really benefit them. 
So the program kind of fills that gap. So, so the, the permanent, you know, we, we see it as a, uh, uh, as a structural <coughs> fix to the labor market, but also a different kind of fix to ensure that there aren't uh, bad poverty paying private sector jobs. So we consider that to be a feature of the program. Not a bug. Not, not a bug. <laughs> but we of course understand that this could be quite disruptive as uh, on the short run. So how it is phased in will matter. Um, the, um, the other thing with respect, to the, with respect to the buffer stock, I mean we have a buffer stock that exists already. That is, you know, the unemployed are the buffer stock. And that buffer stock is already paid for. The unemployed are already part of the public sector. The public sector doesn't just expend money and resources to deal with unemployment, but also with the many social costs of unemployment. Things that we just do not simulate in our model, but there, uh, you know, we do some, you know, some cost savings on EITC and Medicare. But you know, we have urban blight. We have mass poverty. We have children that don't do well in school. We have. Uh, recidivism rates that are super high. I mean, these are enormous costs that are not factored in this model. So, uh, and so, so in a sense, uh, our buffer stock is is superior because you are dedicating financial and real resources in a better way, and you're stabilizing the amplitudes in unemployment that we currently observe in the market. So, we, we actually are stabilizing private sector employment. Should the program is deemed too high? You don't dial it back by laying off workers. Actually, this was uh, one of Keynes's uh, points. You know, he, he used to say, you don't discontinue public works at the peak of the cycle, because this is precisely the time when private firms are working at capacity. They just can't absorb the extra people that have been laid off. So you use other measures. If, if for some reason you know, this program is too big, then you, know, you might think of other ways of boosting either conventional public sector <coughs> employment, private sector employment, to transition people out of the program. OK. Uh, so the $15 wage is a question about minimum wages. It's not a question about the job guarantee. We could set the wage, if you prefer, at $8 an hour. OK? Uh, so we're just going along with a national movement that is pushing to increase the minimum wage to where, almost where it was in the 1960s. Actually, not even quite as high, yep. okay? And we actually had private sector employment in the 1960s, too. I just don't believe the story that the private sector is gonna lose all their workers. They will, you know, pony up, <coughs> raise wages, increase benefits, and stay in business. A few will not, and that's okay. It's okay. If they can't pay $15 an hour and give decent wages, de decent benefits, they should go out of business, okay? <laughs> it's not a problem. We will pick up the employees that they shed. <coughs> what about rural Main Street? <laughs> the same thing will happen all over America, okay? So, but anyway, this is not a question about the job guarantee. That is a question about the minimum wage and where it should be set, okay? So we use 15, and for us, it was also very useful to use that because the great fear is inflation. It turns out it's not inflationary. It just isn't. Okay? We can absorb $15 an hour wages with a temporary boost to inflation, which is what we always argue. So the question about the minimum wage is just a question of a one-time price and wage increase. And then it will settle down, and that's exactly what the FAIR model shows. It settles down. The inflation will disappear. Okay, once the program is fully implemented and the economy adjusts to higher wages and prices, it will go away. The um, $50 an hour worker who loses a job, this is another feature, not a bug. That person should not be in this program. Now, if you look at the unemployment rate of college educated people, it very rarely goes much above 1%. This is not a significant social problem. Now, I realize that that there also were high wage uh, jobs that we've been shedding since 1970, okay? In automobile and so on, in the industrial sector. That is a social problem. It can't be dealt with this way. It needs to be dealt with a different way, okay? We need retraining and we, we may need some industrial policy or whatever it is that we can think of to be a solution for that problem this one doesn't tackle that. 
So for the most part, we don't want to pay $50 an hour to keep those people in these jobs. They shouldn't be in these jobs. They should be out there doing something else. Um, dialing it back, you don't need to dial it back. It's automatic. When the private sector starts heating up, they will pull people out. Now, eventually you're gonna get, let's say the private sector boom for 20 years. You're, this program is gonna shrink and shrink and shrink until you've got the people that the private sector doesn't believe are uh, employable, okay? What do you do? Well, you use the usual policies that we've always used to slow the economy down, right? So if you did get into an expansion that is too robust, you use the normal policies, okay? You can raise taxes, you can cut other kinds of government spending, and, or you can try to use the Fed. So those are all still available. It doesn't, uh, uh, this doesn't create any problem, okay? It will move cyclically. Maybe it won't move enough in the upswing. In the downswing, it, is, uh, it has a perfectly elastic supply of jobs. So in the downswing, it works perfectly well. It will take all the workers that are shed by the private sector who want jobs at $15 an hour. And, and the last thing, just to emphasize what Pauline was saying, you know, we bear the costs already, okay? Uh, <coughs> it costs as much, they say, I don't know this to be true, but it's said all the time, as much to, you know, hold uh, the 2.5 million people in prison as it would to send them all to Harvard. Well, what makes more sense, okay? Employing people or leaving them unemployed so they end up in prison and then we pay as much as we would pay to send them to Harvard. Why not give them a job? and train them on the job, and hopefully they won't end up that way. Okay, good. Uh, I know there are a lot of questions. I just want one, one small kind of technical question about the FAIR model, which I haven't looked at, and I'm really not equipped to anyway. We might not be. But, but I'll just give it a quick try anyway. Uh, you have remarkably low inflation spit, spit out from that. I wonder, is that assuming that the people who get jobs are productive in those jobs? That probably has something to do with it, but exactly. Because obviously, if they're not productive, if they're just drawing a salary and not actually adding to GDP, then you would presumably get more. Yeah, I think there, there are several reasons. You know, one, the, the model, of course, is historically based. Uh, inflate, the inflation pressures have been very low. And as we added workers in the past, it has not boosted inflation. So I think this is sort of carrying that forward, of course, on a bigger scale than usual because we're scaling up by 19 million workers instead of maybe five. Sure, sure. And so there is some inflationary impact, but not very much. But I, I think the that's... The real GDP also, it, it also is not quite significant. There's a, there's a big impact on real GDP from the model. I should also clarify that um, this model, uh, what we're presenting is just a structural adjustment to the economy, the path of, of growth and employment growth in the private sector and uh, GDP, but we haven't simulated yet the cyclical effects. So, you know, we need to run it a different way to be able to see actually how much it shrinks in a recession, uh, in an expansion, how much it expands. All right, so I want to take, oh, you're ready. Well, sorry. just one point. Uh, the, all of these questions were actually raised in the context of the CWA and the WPA, which were much smaller programs than the proposed ELR program. Uh, the issue of inflation, the issue of the productivity of the workers, government workers hired, uh, et cetera, and uh, the issue of the minimum wage. What was it, right? And what you find if you look at the empirical results of the WPA program is none of those uh, issues came to the fore with any significance. In fact, the economy rebounded. Uh, uh, 35, 36, uh, rebounded uh, well enough so that in 37, the Roosevelt administration said, oh, now we can go back to a balanced budget. And we all know what happened when they went back to a proposed balanced budget, right? The economy went into the tank again. And, you know, that, well, we don't have to. So, yeah, the, the issues are, in a sense, have already been debated. But again, in the context of much smaller programs, so I, you know, I'm I'm convinced that Randy Pavlina and others have done their homework, and it's a defensible program. I just don't think it can be implemented. 
<laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do is take three, three questions at a time, and then uh, we'll do a few rounds. So how about right here, the gentleman, the bow guy, wait just hold on a second, and then over there in the corner, you, and then how about right here, this man, and then we'll, then we'll do another round so you get a chance. Go ahead. Uh, I, um, I was, say I was involved 35 years ago, maybe 15 years in mental hygiene. You know, the question of developmentally disabled or mentally ill, I've been involved in the work release programs and halfway houses. Um, you use the term, or you use the number, 32 hours a week, which I see as the Affordable Care Act or the threshold of pain. Why, why not use 40 hours and then figure your, your, uh, your I, I was happy at $1.25 in 1965, okay, and I, I had disposable income. Uh, but I was just, you know, I went through the Nixon uh, wage and price control. Anyway, so okay. why 32 okay. hours? Hold, don't answer yet. We've got to get three <clears throat> questions first over here. Hi there. Um, my question is, this discussion today, it was all about uh, the USA and going back to look at you know, FDR and, and the programs put in place here in the past. I mean, this is a big wide world. Um, things like this have been, have been tried in other countries from, you know, ex the extreme examples, of course, would be the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century to you know, other populist places around the world, whether it's Latin America, Africa, or you name it. And in many cases, you end up with very large numbers of people working for the quote-unquote government, and you know, the quote-unquote government sector just being a huge part of the, uh, of the economy going forward. So I wonder you know, how that example of what we've seen in other countries fits into your analysis. Okay, good, and one more question right here. First, I'd like to say I'm glad you've developed this. This seems like a major step forward. Um, one small part of it that strikes me is should the $15 be adjusted for local costs? Uh, or are we not going to encourage people to migrate from New York and San Francisco to Appalachia or something like that? And then the other one is could this be implemented by Xi Jinping in China? All right. Quick detail, um, 32 hours is not our chosen work week, it's the average when we combine how many people working full-time and part-time. So, you know, for people who are disabled, for people who are caregivers, maybe part-time option is more appropriate. And so we would provide those, uh, those options. Yeah, let me just add, I, I think that 32 hours actually is the average now. And so it's sort of useful to use what is the average that workers are using or, are doing now, and that's uh, that. sort of the split between full and part. Okay, with with respect to experience around the world, um, okay, I should say totalitarian countries have an employer of first and only resort. This is not what we're proposing. We're proposing a buffer stock, the the the, the complement of employment generation in a you know in a market mechanism that you know secures full employment, and we have seen examples. Yeah. Uh, in you know democracies that uh, that have um, sustained very very low unemployment rates or close to full employment, um, like the industrial model in Japan, you know where one percent unemployment or two percent unemployment was the norm until sort of the neoliberal era, where Sweden had the corporate model where the government with unions with firms would sit on the table and figure out okay you can't lay off so many people or you, if you do, we will be the employer of last resort. There are different models of doing this. The one that we studied that was inspired by some of our work at UNKC was, um, was the one in Argentina that was put in place in 2001, and that actually had a lot of the components that we had proposed in, uh, in the job guarantee, <coughs> though it was not a universal open to all program. So in, in its relatively little, uh, short life, we were able to observe some of the features that we uh, said it will have in real time. It did provide sort of a wage base because the people, the government kept track of this data. The people who found employment in the private sector transitioned at 96% of them transitioned above the, the wage that the program offered. Uh, it was very large. It was about 13% of the labor force. I mean, it was a huge crisis. You know, it was more comparable to our Great Depression. But it showed that it can be up and running in a very short period of time. It did exhibit the counter-cyclical effect as well. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, and it was reformed because, <laughs> because the captains of industries oh. thought that those were make work. But we went and we saw the impact of these projects on communities. Uh, let me just add on the um, uh, looking around the world. Uh, yeah, it's, it's true there aren't very many examples of universal programs like this. Um, so she didn't mention India. India, uh, there is a right to demand a job. So it actually has become a right. Okay. The program is not, ex not exactly like uh, what we're proposing. But I would just say, when you look around the world and you see countries that maintain full employment over a fairly long period of time, they all have an effective job guarantee program, or many of them. Uh, so in Italy, as always said, if you can't find anything else, you work on the railroad. So yeah, they end up, a lot of them end up in the public sector. Of course, our public sector, our uh, national government is very small. We're at the very low end of the range. Adding this program is not even going to push us into the middle of developed countries in terms of the size of the national government relative to those economies. We're not going Bolshevik. Okay, it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, um, the national, uh, the, a national $15 an hour wage, or should we have local minimum wages? Minsky always preferred the national. Okay? It's a national <laughs> labor market. Uh, we want to offer the same wage everywhere, a, a good job, $15 an hour, no matter where you live. Might you have some people moving back to the middle of the country? Yeah, and that would not be a bad thing. So we don't want to penalize, say, the middle of the country by giving them uh, lower wages. I don't think I need to say that. Okay, so how about three more questions? Um, 30. The woman in the far back, be number one. Wait, wait, no, way in the, uh, standing against the wall there. Um, and then how about the... Uh, Okay, who are you pointing at? Right here, the, the, the uh, woman here, uh, are you pointing? Are you, who is it? Oh, no, I see, right here, okay, I can see it. Yeah, you, thank you, you're number two. And how about number three right up here in front, and then we'll do three more. Because uh, we have a lot of energy here, so this is great. Nope. Sorry, sorry, Well, um, thank you, Chris, for a very informed, informed discussion. Um, okay, so, um, if I understood correctly, I, I have just two concerns regarding the project. Um, first, um, if, if there is a job guarantee provided by the government, would this somehow create some, some kind of a monopoly when, for example, if there is a crisis and the government wants to maintain full employment, would direct the employment to specific companies and would that create somehow more, more hazard or internal bias? Um, second question. If all the population, if the, 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 the average person knows that there's a guaranteed job, would that create somehow a stagnant eco economy where people get less creative because they know that they guaranteed a job so they wouldn't like um, exert more effort to create something to generate profit? Okay, that's a good one. I need over here. Mm -hmm. Where is? Yeah, hey, I'm just gonna start So whenever I hear about the job guarantee I often think that it only really applies to imperialist countries like the United States that have a lot of um, leeway in terms of expansionary fiscal policy. But what if we look at like developing countries, for example, the country I'm from, Lebanon, um, the foreign exchange rate is actually really important to their economy. If it was to, for example, fall in, rel in relation to the dollar because of expansionary fiscal policy, this would actually potentially spell economic disaster for, for Lebanon and other countries that in which the foreign exchange rate actually is really important. So I was wondering if you could just um, maybe like suggest or give some pointers about how does this job guarantees program apply to developing countries that don't necessarily have the leeway to engage in expansionary fiscal policy like the program calls for. Okay, and then the one up right up in the front here. Can you mic? projections in your, in your model. Um, and this also sort of relates to the previous question about the room to expand um, uh, demand in the economy. 
um, it is, was part of the, the projection that there is excess capacity and that that would sort of absorb the increased demand um, that would be created by the wages for these folks. Okay, great. Okay, um, on the moral hazard and the less creative um, question, this is a philosophical question. We basically do not believe that unemployment um, should be used as a threat to one's existence, essentially. The threat of unemployment is the way to run an economy. Actually, there's really good data that shows that people who are afraid of losing their jobs are less pro productive workers. People who have more stable employment opportunities are happier workers. There's good research that shows the happiness uh, of workers in public versus private sector jobs. So we don't even have to necessarily make the moral argument, but I do want us to make that moral argument. This is you know, sort of grounded in this neoliberal ideology that you know, we're going to keep you you know, uh, afraid uh, for your existence and your, your, your family's existence so you can do X, Y, and Z that we demand of you in the workplace. We, we have an aspirational proposal that sets a floor to standards of living, uh, puts a little pressure on the private sector to find other ways to, uh, you know, to, to have productive workers, and we just think that uh, it just all around makes for a sounder and healthier economy. Okay, uh, so I'll answer that question in a, in a different way. Uh, people who are interested, look at uh, Minsky's last published paper uh, in 1996. Uh, he was very worried about insecurity. So the kind of economy that we have has created this tremendous insecurity that actually dampens uh, the ability to go forward, which is in line with what Aline was saying. But also, I can't see this reducing um, uh, the uh, people's creativity. I mean, think of starving artists, okay? They've got something to fall back on. You can take a chance. You don't have to go work on Wall Street. Try to be an artist. If it doesn't work out, you can work in this program. Hey, artists will be working in the program, okay? Just like in the New Deal, they're going to be painting the post office for you. So <laughs> it's going to lead to an explosion of creativity, just the opposite. Uh, the, uh, I think there was some misunderstanding. Maybe uh, Pavlina didn't mention it. Uh, the uh, program is paid for by the national government. But the jobs are created and managed, and the projects are put forth locally. So these are local NGOs, not-for-profits, possibly uh, local government, and then maybe at the highest level, state government. These are not uh, uh, jobs that are subsidized in the private sector. So you're not creating monopoly power or messing around with competitive enterprise uh, because they don't get any of these workers Okay, in our proposal. There are some proposals where they're in the private sector, but not in ours. Inflation projections, uh, well, yes, there, there is some excess capacity built into these models. I think that another way to look at it is, so in the U.S. now, uh, the wage share is well under 50%, okay? Our inflation is not coming from labor. You can add a lot of workers to the economy, and you're not going to cause inflation. Our inflation is in the markup. It's not in the wages. Uh, how about an answer on the question about Lebanon more directly? Uh, in other words, small con small countries that are exposed. Oh, well, I mean, uh, Pavlina did uh, mention uh, Argentina. Um, this program will help to stabilize the economy. Okay, that is what it does. Uh, it should not lead to a more unstable exchange rate. It will help to stabilize the economy. It should help to stabilize the exchange rate. So yes, uh, developing countries can do this. Um, and uh, I can't see any reason why this is going to cause your foreign exchange rate to go down. Finally, th there also could be another misunderstanding. You can implement a job guarantee without adopting expansionary policy. Okay, it depends on where you set the wage. And and uh, even with the wage, it's a one-time jump up. So this program is 
not necessarily an expansionary program at all. It is a stabilizing program. Just, I don't, don't want to comment, yeah. but on this point, imagine, uh, you know, we, we have the incarceration example. So what is it, the, the state of New York pays uh, $70,000 per, per inmate. If it is true that we are reducing a whole slew of other costs, social costs and expenditures, this could be deflationary. Okay, hey, John. Uh, yeah, just a small point on creativity. Uh, you know, Randy said painting the post office. Well, the murals, <laughs> which are <laughs> classic artistic works, including murals uh, that were painted by Diego Rivera. Now, why the hell he was hired in the DWP uh, is beyond me. But in any case, uh, the Federal Music Project, the Federal Theater Project, uh, various artistic activities that were undertaken within the context of the WPA. And it was those projects, particularly the theater project, that directly attacked racism. And it was the only uh, WPA or New Deal project that attacked racism. There's no civil rights activity in the Roosevelt administration at all. And that's what got, it was the Federal Theater Project that got the WPA into political hot water because it undercut the segregationist system of the United States, predominantly, of course, in the southern states, and businessmen protested because they would, if this stuff went forward, they'd have to pay the same wages to black workers as they did white workers. Okay, uh, any more questions? Um, way over on the wall, be number one. Okay, uh, Lakshma, number two, and then uh, Right here. Yeah. And then we'll, we have some time for more rounds because, hey, Jan said so. <laughs> I thought this is one of the uh, institutional proposals that uh, was debated by policy makers within the United States, not outside the United States, some out of the box. Uh, thinking is overdue, especially to battle the inequality. However, where I see the weak point here is funding, not the market, even though I would be hesitant to set the minimum wage because you replace the market wise, both the employment market and the wage market, and you take away all the bargaining models of neoclassical economics. But uh, in any case, I can leave with that. Uh, Funding is extremely important, and uh, I'll explain why. Everything has a law of unintended or intended consequences. Where I find this implementable and not just defensible is five or ten years hence, when the robots will have replaced skilled workforce and the universities, because of the change of the skill set required, not, the, not higher education, the, not just a tertiary education, the universities will be producing unskilled people. And you will need a program like this in order not to make everybody uh, living on a wage level compared to 19th century. This is a, a recent statement in Edinburgh from the uh, governor of the Bank of England. But also to skill, to retool these smart people who will not have the right uh, skill set to be competitive in the new artificial <coughs> intelligence uh, economy and society. Okay. Having said up. that, where is the money going to come from? <laughs> okay, good. That's, that's a good one. Uh, thank you. Uh,
problem is the distribution of jobs. But the problem is that with increased productivity, what we've lost is we've lost high-end jobs, and it's forced those people down in lower and lower into the ranks of lower paid, lower skilled jobs. So now we have an overabundance of low skilled jobs with no attention being paid to working your way up the, uh, the pay scale for people further up. Um, the other thing is you're going to have, a, as you described, you're going to have at least a constant number of unemployed. If you add to that the number of people who are employed in low skilled jobs, then you have a pretty big number of people who need help from a, some kind of a job program. That means you're going to need a permanent workforce. You're going to need to have career opportunities. You're going to need to be able to move up the pay scale. You're also going to need to have managers who are able to lay off workers who are not performing. You're going to need to have uh, criteria for judging uh, performance. So, you know, this is this flies in the face of a lot of the things we're talking about. It wouldn't work. You may end up needing two, two separate programs. But you need to address the problem of what's happening not just with the chronically unemployed, but with people all the way up the work. Okay, good. Um, um, all right. Funding. The funding comes from the federal government. The money is appropriated through Congress. Checks don't balance. In the United States, we have funding capacities. We have sovereign monetary system. We can fund whatever we wish to fund. That could be a challenge for a Eurozone country, uh, without a doubt. And so you will have to do some sort of different empirical analysis there to see where the cost savings are. My bet is that the current model, paying for unemployment is still more expensive than paying for employment. Mm -hmm. um, robots and, so, so here's, here's the issue. Uh, you know, we happen to believe that the, you know, the majority of the technolo technology jobs have not been invented, created, we haven't conceived of them. There will be a lot of work coming uh, forward. Uh, so we, you don't think that uh, robots are going to completely make work obsolete. It's going to be a different kind of work, and um, uh, we will be prepared. But the vast majority of human activity, 80% of all work, is the reproduction of labor, taking care of each other. It's service sector jobs. It is feeding, clothing, educating, entertaining, all of that good stuff. And there isn't really a limit to this sort of thing, uh, to those jobs that we can create. So um, there will be structural changes in the private sector economy, but those changes will be far less disruptive with a program like this in place if we didn't have one. And in, in terms of restructuring of jobs, there is a hollowing out mostly from, from middle, you know, middle in, um, uh, uh, middle uh, wage uh, jobs, you know, mostly manufacturing, etc. But as I was saying, it is the service sector job that it is taking over. So what we did once for manufacturing, we need to do the same for the service sector. You know, manufacturing wasn't great and fabulous type of work. It was poorly paid, awful conditions, and we made those good jobs. We need to do the same with, with the service sector. This is a way of facilitating that process, but clearly is not a panacea to all sort of labor market uh, uh, issues or challenges. Okay, on the um, minimum wage interfering with the uh, labor market, yeah, that's the idea. That's why we have minimum wage. <laughs> the funding, it, yeah, it's all keystrokes. Um, Uncle Sam won't run, run at keystrokes, so it will come from the same place Trump's tax cuts come from. Keystrokes. Is a reverse, ours are positive keystrokes. Everyone living in the 19th century, uh, <laughs> on 19th century wages, I just don't believe the story. It's not going to happen. When you fly, ask, you know, when you're sitting next to someone, ask them, you know, what do you do for a living? And you'll just be amazed. Yeah. These are jobs you never heard of, never could have imagined anyone would need. That's what people do. Okay? We won't run out of that stuff. It doesn't solve the problem of high skills. That is true. We need other labor market problems, uh, programs. We have problems that this program will not solve. I don't think we should try to make this program solve every labor market. Problem. That would be a mistake. Let's have other uh, programs to deal with the problems of the high skills. Um, and the management, uh, yes, we, we recognize that uh, you're going to have non-PSE workers as managers. Part of the reason why we decentralize 
is because we want to take the people who are already managing in your local not-for-profit, in your Red Cross office. We want to ask them, how many more workers can you supervise? And though they will then hire out of the pool. So we're going to use the managers that already exist. Okay. Uh, but one more small point. You didn't go far enough. You should ask the question, you should have people ask the question, what does a job mean? Okay? Because it's only been recently that we have actually worked for wages. And that's you know, the relationship to the job itself. We've always worked, but we've only recently had jobs uh, for the uh, for most of us, right? So that though, then that gets into the nature of this monetary production economy where the objective is exchange for profit and all that sort of stuff. And that's of course, if people start asking those questions, that's where the real danger lies. Because you say, we don't need this form of economic organization to survive. We all might right. be better off without it. So I know there are a lot more people with questions, which is a great sign. It means it was a fascinating <laughs> session, and it really was. But we have to end now. So please, please uh, round of applause for all the panelists.